Hey, folks. Hello. Nice forest. <laughs> the far, yeah. I actually got some more pictures I got to post. There. Give everybody a couple of minutes here. Trishank, are you doing the um, signing content? No, unfortunately not. Radu and I decided to shelve that for next week. Oh, okay. That was our, let me pull up what the agenda was then. Yeah, I know. It was supposed to be the first thing, but uh, <laughs> next week works better for us. Thanks. Is Radu actually getting sleep this week? I don't know how he does it. Um, oh, okay. And you deleted this. The, okay. Uh, that was our main topic. Um, okay. In fact, I just mentioned, I was looking forward to seeing what you guys had. Uh, okay. Well, the, discusses the comment you just left in the notary channel, if you like. Um, which yeah, I we, saw the replies in that thread, but I haven't had a chance to really look at it. Uh, oh, there was a bunch of replies, I see. All right, well, okay, let's. Um, okay, why don't we do this? Um, all right, I'm a little thrown because I was really looking forward to the signing thing. So I'm trying to figure out and I was actually not sure we we're gonna have time for the other, what, um, all right, so what I had, had on the agenda was actually, so let me just pull it up here. Uh, oh, I see, you just moved to July 6th. Sorry, I was seeing signing show up again. Uh, I was getting confused. Um, so what the, the sketch that I'm talking about is the thing that we've been talking about for a while that might, I'm going to propose we talk about that for more, in addition to just being on the agenda. I, the whole goal of this one, and let me just put it here. Uh, and I can share my screen as well. Um, share screen. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, all right. So what I'll do a quick overview of it because the, the goal, it, it's why I haven't done the PR and yet is I wasn't quite ready for it to, for a larger discussion. So I'll, um, I, we're always ready for a larger discussion, but uh, there were some details that people were asking that I wanted to cover first. Um, the main thing that I think we were struggling with is what is the high level scenario and an approach that we could go about it? Uh, because what we're seeing is we have a bunch of subject matter experts that really know their area really well. Um, and because this problem is so deep in so many areas that it's really hard for everybody to be an expert in everybody else's area. So I was trying to figure out how can we frame this so that um, the key management experts that really are focused, let's say on offline keys like Niaz and, um, and uh, some of the other folks, I'm just, yeah, he is here, great. I uh, can say, look, I, I don't know well this other stuff, but I know where I got to plug in, let me focus on this. And they're going to surface up a set of questions and issues and uh, requirements that we have to then adapt on another part and likewise back and forth. So, I was trying to figure out how to frame this. We've been referring to a sketch. We've been referring to kind of buildings. Um, if you think of like uh, people that have really detailed designs on really cool bathrooms and so forth, like where, where does that fit in the house or other parts? So I was kind of thinking, uh, just was thinking of the way Gaudi had done uh, the Sagrada Familia and how he had basically was trying to come up with this new way of doing these amazing churches and the flying buttress design was so bulky and not you know, uh, what he was looking for. 
So what he did was he built a sketch of it. Well, not a sketch. In this case, it was a model. He started with sketches uh, and then built this model, which if you haven't seen it, it's really amazing the way they just used sandbags filled with I forgot, uh, bird shot that created this natural uh, curve. And he was able to prototype some things and figure out how it worked, which of course then goes, great, I got the structure, but where does all the stairwells and the plumbing and the lighting, and there wasn't really that much lighting back then, but where does all of the infrastructure and the other pieces of a, uh, in this case, a church fit into it? So it, that sketch and the very many models, I was trying to find some that were open uh, licensed so I can put it here, um, but just do some sketches of, uh, of the physical models that they've made to prototype designs. And it's through that that they were able to come up with better approaches to, to facilitate communications. So that's been what I've been trying to put that in place because I'm not the expert in any particular area, um, but I can try to facilitate this conversation between folks so that we can figure out, for instance, where does um, various pieces come in? I'll pause there for a moment. Yeah, I think, I mean, this is fairly similar to the models we've had before. I guess one thing that's been a little harder in this community is usually we've, um, when we've worked with other folks in like, for instance, the automotive space, like I, I, I guarantee you that um, I know a hundred times more about uh, cloud deployment scenarios that I knew about automotive when I first started there. Um, and we, we, um, I agree that we need to kind of be working together and working together more closely. And I think, um, you know, have more of, um, like a common goal about what we're trying to achieve and then be working more closely together to get there and meet everyone's needs. Um, because our goal here, I, I feel like there's tension where it's almost like there's groups building, trying to build different models and then arguing about that, which is not like Gaudi didn't go and then get a bunch of people to design different things and then like in the end, try to glom it together or try to try to do whatever. I, I think we need to, um, you, like all all decide that we're going to try to row the same boat for a while and see how that goes. Because I think the kind of um, trying to pull different directions is, is, what's, is what's causing this to be problematic. Agreed. I think, um, well, anybody else? Okay, so part of it, I think, is this is why we we're trying to get the scenarios down up front, so down, um, done up front, was that we could have that as the basis on what we're working on. Um, one of the things uh, that I've kind of see us get, you know, very focused on, and this is because that's probably your expertise in this area, is Justin, is the the update uh, scenario, and you know, the more obviously the update framework has a lot to do with that. And when the more I was reading, the more I was kind of seeing that's the pattern that's consistent with what you've been representing. Um, one of, I think what you're seeing is the, that's a build, there is a build scenario where that is important and we still, you know, so it's not like it's not important. We do need to think about it. But when we think about doing deployments um, in the container space, we talk about them in very immutable fashions. Like you don't actually update a tag and ask a bunch of people to update that particular reference thing because it creates an insta unstable environment where you have multiple instances that could be out of sync with each other. Um, whereas in the base image update, we want that because I want to know that I'm referencing version 14, you know, something. Um, and when security updates come in, I get those because I'm referencing that thing, but I then have to test them and, you know, verify them. Uh, the other 
angle to that is the idea that there's this soul dependency, not soul, but a, a very heavy weighted dependency on a, on a public uh, registry that all environments pull from. And the thing we're seeing more and more is customers want private copies of theirs, even of public content, um, so that they have the ability to pull that public content in, including the updates to a tag for base images, base artifacts and then test those. And then they reference those in their private environment. They have like a, a corporate set of artifacts that they reference that all teams would reference, even smaller teams. So I, I think it's a combination of those two high level bits that um, would help to figure out where they fit in because there's, then we get into the details of repos and the firmware clients and other stuff that I think will flow out of that, that we can figure out how to uh, address some of those but they're kind of rooted in the scenarios. Maybe the second point is the easier one to talk about first, um, which is that like, if there's tough metadata on a public repo, tough targets metadata, you can copy that tough targets metadata to your private repo and just use it there. It's, it's not like, um, it's not somehow associated with the repo your private repo will have its own snapshot file and will list that targets metadata on it. But there's no, um, like there's nothing stopping you from taking targets metadata, which is, you know, just for everyone, targets metadata is the thing that's actually has the secure hashes that's actually signed by the developers that points to the images or whatever. So you can, I think the second case you you already sort of have this with the tough design. I, I think the thing that I struggle with is we keep on, uh, we, we talk about it as if this is an assumed fact and, we, and it's easier to use as opposed to, I'm still struggling a little bit of, is it really the, it, we start with the end result and we could use it here, but the question is, should we? And where does, and how does it apply? Um, when I see things like uh, the client initialization is out of scope, that you know, like that concerns me. Um, the complexity of trying to pull these things together, you know, I, I think we're, how we're, we're real quickly going down a rabbit hole again here. I mean, you, you I, laid out. I think we're starting with the place of you're arguing that we should. It, it's okay. We can use this, and I'm saying I'm still trying to understand what is the purpose of it. Like, what problem does it solve? Right. I mean, we're going to have kind of deja vu in this meeting all over again. We're, we're welcome to go back through the scenarios and talk about the, the problems and talk about why when you have tag matching, you, the repository telling you what your tag latest matches is problematic, that you need signed metadata from the user to do that. Like fundamentally, if you want, we don't want the repository to be able to control what a tag points to. So, and, and that to me is an important like use case or attack case. Even if it's common that people use tags differently, it's not always the case that they use latest. Sometimes they do, but in those cases, it's, it's important. That and about, you know, the, I don't know, half a dozen other reasons that we brought up related to all the problems with snapshot and everything else that we talked about. There's like a whole bunch of small, but in, in, you know, seemingly important little reasons there. But the, the case of copying metadata over, I mean, you brought up two cases. You said copying metadata over. You can literally just take and copy targets metadata over and stick it on the other repository, on the private repository. And that works just fine, right? So um, that's, there's, you know, and I, if you want me to talk in more detail about why that works or what happens, I can, but that's, that's sort of like, that's a non issue. Um, the, um, the first point you brought up, um, was saying, oh, this is for updates. This is whatever, you know, tough, um, tough does key management. It does like revocation of trust. It does all sorts of things. Yes, in some cases, if you're doing, depending on how you do your trust on first use or what you do or why, then some of these properties are better or worse. 
just like in some cases, if your network's protected and there really aren't any bad guys on it, then, um, you know, then like TLS isn't helping you, right? But hey, you know, like you, you still may use it because it's, it's uh, considered helpful. So once again, I feel like we've, we've kind of gone backwards. Like I felt like you, you laid out two things that were quite constructive that we could talk about. And now it's kind of like, well, but yeah, those two things maybe are solved, but let me move the goalposts and talk about the things that I think are a problem. Like tough doesn't mandate a way to deal with how you do trust and first use. Well, we don't mandate it, but we support like the, the way in notary V1 does it is not the way that we recommended it be done. And, and, you know, isn't the way that I'm aware that any other group does, does trust for, for this. It's still supported. We could do it in notary V2 and some people might in certain environments, but this isn't like, you know, this isn't like um, the fact that Tuff allows you to pick a couple of options here isn't necessarily mean that Tuff can't do this problem. It just means that there's, there's multiple paths that different people have chosen. So um, I don't know. Like, I, let me shut up for a bit and let others hopefully respond and weigh in. I, mean, I think it could, oh, sorry, thanks. Uh, I think it could just be a mismatch of, of, of honestly just language and expectations really. Like, um, I think the way we design tough now and we made like a radical change to it, right? Like, like with design option two, with the, with the Merkle tree snapshot metadata, we're, we're fairly confident it will work with all of the, uh, your, your deployment scenarios. But I think what's not clear to you guys is that that really is the case, especially with things like that seem to pop up all the time, like bootstrapping root metadata, which we think is a fairly simple problem, but maybe, maybe it is just something we're not understanding here. So I think, I think I think we just need a meeting to sit down and and figure out this 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 problem once and for all, right? Like if we if 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 the thinking is that tough is not going to solve the problems at all, like we need to know why, and we we we're fairly confident we can fix the problems, and we're also not trying to at the same time trying to forcefully shoehorn tough here and say. This is the only thing that 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 can possibly work, but we're fairly confident that any solution that that we end up designing would look fairly similar. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense, but no, it does. I think this piece that I, like I said, the piece that I'm struggling with is we start with that's the answer, and let's when it's easy to use, as opposed to we don't the we don't see the updating of a tag being the primary concern. In fact, there's a design proposal that we've talked about that there's an immutable tag option that says that you, in the spec, like all the clouds have actually supported this option in various forms that you can lock a tag from being updated. Maybe that's something we should put into the spec that says there is a standard way that a tag cannot be changed um, for one set of, you know, for the deployment scenarios. So I think that's the part that, that it gets gets me uncomfortable is when we keep on talking about that as the primary scenario when that's not the primary problem. Oh, I think I see what you're saying. Yes, that that what that also wasn't clear to me until recently either. But yes, uh, I've come to understand that the latest thinking in the industry is that, yeah, tag tag should be. In fact, you don't even want to pull things necessarily by tags anymore. You want to pull things directly by digest. At least in the CNAP world, that is the thinking. Yeah, and I, that's, I'd actually suggest that the reason people go to digest is because tags don't have a way to be locked. If we had, because there's problems with digest as well being very long, not very um, you know, friendly, being able to see in logs or in, in dashboards, and there's no break glass scenario. So if you have a tag and it's locked, then you can use it. But, um, and if you have a reason to break glass and say, I do need to update the tag, you do have an option there. Um, but I, I would say that, you know, it, it is, it's not really a best practice to use digest. It's an immutable workaround to the limitations of what's available. So who, who decides to lock a tag? The user, right? Like the, the person using the re registry decides to lock a tag, correct? The entity, the owner of the entity, whatever it might right. be. Okay. And then who enforces locking a tag? 
Like, how does that actually happen? It, it would be the registry that enforces it, right? Correct, right. The t registry okay. would enforce that ability with a set of roles and capabilities that have a delegation for, right. which well, is although, clarity we need to put in here as well. And I think it's not, yeah, the registry doesn't entirely enforce it and of it because you, can not, you could delete a tag and recreate it with a different value in most models. I believe, and obviously, um, you know, there's still the attacker scenario of the attacker, uh, an attacker coming in and modifying the registry to change the tag. Perfect. Yeah. So the, the attacker the can enforce their by just not signing any other version of the tag. If you yeah, want. there's a couple. I mean, hacking a registry is certainly a problem, and there's some pieces of this that I really like. But like part of the immutable tag is if you lock a tag, it can't be deleted anyway either. So there's a couple of things around that, that there's some pieces in place that can at least address that problem. Um, and then I think as Mita was just referring to, like if, you, if somehow it was deleted and replaced, then the idea is that the replacement wasn't signed. So this is where the threat model stuff comes in of like, well, wh where is the attack vectors? Because there's certainly lots of them along the way. Um, that we want to try to figure out how do you protect against. And, and yeah, there are ways you can cryptographically do this. So for example, within a pen only lock, you can do this. The thing is we need to figure out what the problem is, such as this locking tags. Like if that's a requirement then we need to build into our design. Uh, Justin, you were saying something. Yeah, I was actually saying that um, the way you would do this in tough is you wouldn't end up trusting the repository or registry in order to do this action because you would upload the signed metadata and you would effectively um, not update that tag anymore, not have the user that's, that is the one that's responsible that has the key, have them you know, go and do this locking. And so like using it in this way, just, just for this one like specific problem, it helps to remove the fact that you're, re you're relying on the registry for enforcement of this property in other scenarios. So even if an attacker breaks into a registry, at least for any client that has some prior metadata, um, which you know doesn't have to be a pure update case, but can be your trust on first use means that you have at some point preloaded and then you know when you do your local deployment, you're including some of that metadata as we discussed, as you would uh, like preload registry keys and lo location and stuff then that, um, that cryptographically signed information, uh, effectively, you're, you're now um, not ending up trusting the registry to enforce that, that property, which is, is um, from a security standpoint, better, because no longer is it just some access control thing, but it actually you know, has, someone would have to steal the key from the owner and then make changes that way. So one of the things, and this is part of what I'm hoping this sketch will come out and you know, I'm trying to write up some of the end-to-end -end scenarios to flush through this is, is that new ephemeral client. And one of the things that I'm, I'm hearing is, you know, obviously we, trusting just one entity is bad, whether it be the registry or a single user with a key and so forth. And, that, and the key in this case, let's talk about the, the nuclear submarine thing, right? There's just always this two, a minimum of two that have to agree. So if, they, if we can't trust the client, because the, not that we can't trust, the, the client could have got hacked as well, but the fact is the client is a new client being doled out for use, and there's nothing there yet specific to that environment, then I need to be able to get that information. And, and, I'm, and I apologize for posting this just like a half an hour before the meeting, and I didn't get a chance to read the replies. But what I liked about the, what you're trying to do there is the original design from what I was reading is their client has some piece of information and I have to correlate the, the registry in this case, the repository of my client to see if they got out of sync and something got hacked. If I don't have any, have any information on the client, then, and I can't solely trust the registry, then is there some other entity that would also have to get hacked as well? And what would that look like? Uh, what is that other entity? So as I understand it from what we were talking about before, when we were talking about deployment scenarios, you're using Docker secrets or something else like this to load in information about like go to this registry and use these keys and so on. And so if you're loading in that initial metadata in, and that metadata includes 
just like you know an initial copy of like uh, the top uh, metadata, which isn't much larger than just the list of keys, depending on what you know how you set things up. But if you set them up in the way I think we described, then that actually is the place that provides you that extra assurance. And that where thing do you that get it from? Is the question because like the like the your, what I've been hearing you saying is the tough metadata is in the repository, the registry, the repository within a registry. Um, so if I have a uh, new client and I have to initialize uh, it, where do I get it from? I'm saying something slightly different. So as a new client, forget about whether you're using tough or anything else, mm -hmm. right? You're going to get keys and things loaded into you via Docker secrets or some other mechanism like that. So map secrets into your container, spiffy spire, whatever. Somehow you're going to end up getting like, um, like the, like the sort of like secrets and configuration and whatever else you need. Mm -hmm. So that secret configuration information, you know, which is often, you know, a key or some URLs with a like secure hash of the thing you're downloading or whatever else. Um, if that's, that's it, you're actually saying that part, that's, that's the part we don't have yet. If we, the client has creds of some sort that says it can pull from a registry it has some policy that says what it can do, but where does it get that, that metadata that you're referring to, to then have the comparison? The same way it gets its cred and its policy. Because so we it, store it, it in a separate entity? entity? Sorry, say again? We store it in a separate entity than the registry? Yeah, so uh, you're getting your creds and your policy from an entity separate from the registry, right? Right. So just your, now your credentials, effectively just include the initial metadata. So and then there's a service that keeps that second store in sync because it's doing the timestamp metadata and, and periodically pushing it to this other entity that both would have to be hacked. Well, yeah, I mean, you initial sample policy are typically going to be a, in a configuration system and long lived, they may perfectly well be a year old if this uh, recency freshness requ uh, enforcement requires them to be regularly updated, that's a new mechanism. I'm not saying it's, impo it's not impossible, but it's definitely new. It, it's not trivially derived from just obtaining the policy. Well, I think you just need the root metadata file, which is typically long lived anyway, like it's supposed to expire in a year. So that, yeah, that should be all you need. And then I lose the freshness basically because I start with a blind state. It's not worse than not having the freshness and enforcement in there. It's just that the ephemeral files don't, don't have that. Well, the of freshness guarantee is hard. given. Sorry. Uh, the, the freshness guarantee is given by downloading the timestamp snapshot, which can also be bootstrapped. I mean, it can be a year old, which is not going to give you the strongest freshness guarantees, but certainly better than having nothing. So I think that the root of what we're talking about, there's some detail about what data and how long and so forth is there's this other process that is, has a, a different way of getting a different, uh, a path of getting information from the registry to get some snapshot, some metadata around a particular each repo and it's stored in a secondary entity so that a, a, an ephemeral client that comes in that wants to initialize there's a set of information it has to get. And obviously if it's getting keys, there's a certain amount of trust that allows it to get the key so it doesn't get the wrong keys um, or the wrong configuration. It says, instead of go to my trusted registry, go to bad trusted registry and download this code that will send out all credit card information. Like there's a certain set of boundaries that are put in place. And it's not that any one entity is trusted more than the others is there's this correlation of in order for somebody to hack the system, they literally have to get into multiple highly secured entities. Um, so as long as there's a process by which that takes this metadata out of the registry, puts it in some other location, and that process has to be a, almost a third trusted trust boundary. Then as a client, I come in like, hey, I woke up from the world. Why is everybody wearing masks? Okay, let me just get to work, right? It says, okay, let me get some key information from here and that's secure. And based on that, I go to over here. And then as part of the thing booting up, it does a check and says, okay, that information I have from there matches that. Now I can proceed. 
Um, is that kind of fit into what we're talking about? Because that, to me, would solve some of the concerns where I've been worried about the complexity and where does it add value in, in this scenario, not all value, obviously. Yeah, you would get that. I mean, so so if if you have a version of root metadata was from a year ago, and let's say you've made two two recent key rotations since then, this this key rotation will be handled automatically for you. Now, one thing that will happen is that for as long as you don't update the uh, secondary store with the latest root, your new clients will end up pulling like the latest root over and over and over again, and it'll be inefficient, but all you have to do is update the secondary store. And this should be a rare, rare uh, situation. And you can do it once a year, you can do it once a month, once a week, once a day. You know, the frequency by that which you do that is a balance of performance and security, if I understand that right. Right, exactly. The only thing you will be pulling, new clients will be pulling over and over again, uh, is basically the timestamp and the snapshot metadata. This will change a lot, but only on every pull. You're not going to, you're certainly not going to pull all the changes in between. Right. Because the way I think about structuring this is like, um, a deployment, if it's a unique tag, and we have this way to lock tags so they can never be updated, um, then the deployments don't need to do this kind of deeper checking. There's something there that, that I don't know exactly the details are, we have to figure that out. But certainly in the build environment where it's not critically timed compared to a production deployment, it's, uh, it, it'll, it is a dangerous time because you have new code being pulled in and so forth that it can do these deeper checks and says, hey, I, I am in a build environment, do support base image update tags, right? The, the version of the thing she gets updated for security fixes. It could break because the security fix breaks uh, a functionality compatibility. So there's always extra work going on then anyway. And then we can do this uh, tag update scenario where we're trying to make sure all the rich metadata is done that what I what feels good about that is I'm doing the more complex thing at the more scary thing when it's not a critically timed and the more critical deployment thing where I'm trying to literally start a function in less than a second. And I want to be able to get some content to be able to do that. Um, I can still get the right level of security because I never support an updated tag. So it seems like a balance between the two. And I, maybe it's making sure that that's in the scenarios. I think I have builds in the scenarios in the sketch. Yeah, the way the way that design option two is structured, right, is is exactly uh, to address your concern, which is that performance is key here. You do want security, but you don't want to block on it. So it's deliberately designed to get you started as as quickly as possible. And if you want to do deeper checks, you can. Thoughts by others? Justin uh, uh, Cormack, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say, I kind of agree with uh, uh, revisiting the scenario stock because I think that we've come across several scenarios like this where the, because the end-to-end -end, uh, workflows aren't well documented, uh, whenever we're, we're debating the scenarios, whenever we end up looking at some implementation. Um, and it's been difficult, I think, to kind of understand like what we're working towards and what problems things are solving. I agree with that. I don't think this is necessarily moving the goalpost as, as much as it is us realizing that we've never really had the scenarios well defined. So I think it actually makes sense to kind of go through and add uh, more meat to that doc. Um, it's something I've brought up with uh, Omar as well on our side, on the AWS side. He, he plans on participating more. Um, and I think like that will at least help us understand um, how stuff is addressing some of these problems and what the gaps are that we need to close. We just put, we have the, what, uh, one of the latest PRs yeah. on this that we can maybe um, continue to work on it. Uh, yeah, here we go. I'll paste this in the Slack. Slack team. What 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 are we on? <laughs> uh,
Where do I? It's interesting. It doesn't give you the chat window when you're doing this. Okay. So definitely let's take a look at this. Um, make sure that we're not missing scenarios or where there is clarity we wanted to follow up. That's the PR to the scenarios that are in there now. Um, and remember, we wanted to separate the threat modeling from the You know, kind of the scenario ones. So we we saw a good start with that the uh, threat model ones. So Justin and uh, Cormac and and Derek, what I'm sure you've had this conversation around the the tag locking stuff. If we, you know what if we had something like that, would that help with some of this? Like in a spec, like it was part of a standard thing of OCI, maybe it's OCI v2, whatever. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I think that there are definitely, I mean, I think uh, there are some people who definitely want to work like that. There are other people who don't. Um, and so I don't think it's a solution that's going to work for everyone. I don't think we can impose lock tags because I think there are people who are, I, you know, people who are using latest and will continue to use latest and it's difficult mm -hmm. to change their behavior. So I think we can't, um, we can't make that the only behavior. We, I don't know if we could, I mean, if we could make better security guarantees, if you, only use tags in an immutable way, then we might persuade more people to use immutable tags if that were the case, if it was, um, if that helped us in a make the design better. I think, um, uh, I think that might be okay. And so you might get, um, you might get better guarantee. I mean, well, uh, it depends on exactly what the, the guarantee what that really meant but i could see a yeah. situation where we could we could discuss that kind of trade-off so it's interesting you went the other way i was thinking when you started saying people following a certain pattern is there's people locking to digest because those are immutable but not very friendly from length and read readability there's a lock tag which we don't really support and then there's the latest tag i always air quote because latest should anyway um a stable tag uh but it's what we could do based on what we just you know, said prior to this with what Trishank was saying with design option two, I think, is you could still get security on latest because we're gonna need that on build. It's that it's a more um, heavyweight performance, performance implication thing. So as we all see with people learning containers, they will learn one way and it'll work. And for performance reasons, they wanna do it a slightly different way. Um, it's just a, it becomes a tweak. So in this case, it's not that it's an insecure way. It would still be secure because we need it for builds. It would just be less performant and more. Yeah, I think that's that, that's definitely a sort of trade. We could definitely that sort of trade off definitely acceptable. Yeah. Okay. I mean, for me, it, I don't think there'd be much changes to the spec to support something like tag locking. I mean, we could define an error case. Um, or maybe a condition where when you upload, you can set a flag that says, like, mark this as locked. Um, but the registry may or may not ignore that in, uh, in that case. Uh, for me, what I'd like to see happen more is moving tags and digest as not one or the other, but kind of two dimensions. So, like, uh, for example, in Containerd, we have tag at digest to represent, like, you could pull an image and you pull latest and then you pull latest again, that same image is, is locked there as latest at what the previous hash was. Uh, we keep track of the, the timestamps associated with that. Um, so I, I think one of the things we're missing, not just the locking, but the actual like tag history and making sure that, especially for like provenance reasons inside of notary that we have, we know when everything was signed 
because we know that just because a tag got updated doesn't mean that nothing is relying on the previous tag version for deployment. Is that how you do the performance uh, performance hop so you can see if I have the latest version by checking if the digest match, matches the tag? Uh, we do that, yeah. I mean, there's like a, it's kind of like an e-tag check just to see like uh, whether or not this, this is the same. Um, Sweet. I mean, that's not specific what we do in Containerd because we, we point it at a specific manifest to check, but that's how we, that's how we actually keep track of everything. Because in Containerd, the image name is actually the top level reference. Um, so we actually create two tags. We'll create one that's like an at, uh, like at digest mm -hmm. and one without it so that you can keep the other one around after you pull a different version. And the tag history has always been a challenge. I, I, don't, I don't know if I've seen anybody that does it really well. We certainly, something we've wanted to do is like, if I do have an update and it's broken, how do I get to the previous one? Like there's no good historical index thing. So it'd be nice to have that formalized as well. But that's a, that's a good fallback and usability. I think the, the locking, um, that feels like a good trade-off, I guess is what I'm kind of getting at is you can go all the way to digest, you can go to tags with a lock and have some confidence of performance. And then you can, for what we would say is the best practice for deployments anyway, and then for build scenarios where we do want to support the updating of a tag, um, we can do the deeper checks. And we do it in a way that the client isn't assumed to be in a previously known state. We have to do this separate entity verification uh, process. Yeah, and one thing to keep in mind is some implementations of the registry, the actual storage are fairly um, eventually consistent. So like you could, you could push up the same tag to two different, it's kind of the latest wins, which isn't great. And that's really why you need something like notary or something if, if you really want to enforce, enforce that behavior. I should note that having something like the snapshot metadata actually gives you auditability for free in this sense. If you keep adding every new snapshot metadata to something like a transparent log, right, which is an append-only log, you, you could actually audit whether or not people have uh, mutated tags. So that's, that's an interesting property to have. Yeah, being able to, like, there's no standard um, for uh, a tag update scenario. Um, for good or bad reasons. Um, it's something we, you can put in your diagnostics and logs, you know, uh, history, but there's no uh, standard API that anybody could run for some security scanners. Hey, here's the way AWS, ACR, uh, Azure, and Google do it, and Docker Hub, and blah, blah, blah. Um, cool. All right. Uh, thoughts? I, I wanted to talk about, I put on the agenda that I want to talk about the, um, ephemeral grants thing. So oh, yeah. in particular, um, I mean, I think there were two things about option one and the signature design doc that I think are problematic. Um, one of which was the discussion we were having about actually the feasibility of constructing independent sets of images, which is pretty unclear that I can work at all. But the second thing. Can you elaborate was, on that? I'm, I'm well, lost. It's not. It's uh, there's a side conversation that Samuel started, but um, um, it's not. It's not clear how you could actually even partition the registries into a set, sets of images with different permissions in any useful way, because you don't know what the you don't really know what a client's permissions are until you actually try and do an authorization check on it so you don't you if you have something that can just to just tells you if something has access to something you don't you can't actually create sets from it i'm a little but, lost but that's but that, 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 that piece is <laughs> they, that, that, read the conversation that's actually not the bit i want to talk about okay um but the other bit i want to talk about was the fact that um i think we need to actually have a position on ephemeral clients because the the other problem with this is that 
clients have different security guarantees depending on um, which images they have downloaded metadata for. So effectively, we got very path dependent security, and I think we need to make we need to have a position that um, ephemeral clients are an extremely important case, and therefore um, that's the secure that's the security given that in the in this option one this is that's the wor it's always the worst case for rollback protection we should basically say that this is it's a this is and is also in the in the other docs from last week um because i wasn't on last week's call but like no roll you basically get much worse rollback protection if you haven't pulled things before you're ephemeral and we should treat this as being the normal case and optimize for that case rather than assume rather than in the um rather than assume that clients have actually pulled metadata before um so i think both those things effectively are ruling against option one as being feasible so um they both kind of, both of those kind of mitigate towards something more like option two, um, but I was thinking as I that the the Merkel tree design is looking um, looking a bit more like a transparency log than um, um, and and like maybe a transparency log is what we is more what we want in order to provide those kinds of guarantees because it doesn't rather than assuming that clients are constantly pulling um pulling metadata from registry whereas in fact we know that a lot of clients are ephemeral and that um the kind of that's more like what option two is starting to look like to me sort of as it comes together yeah, I, I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think we had a little bit of hesitation because we felt like a transparency log was adding a lot more complexity. But uh, I think the the what I've understood a little more is the difficulty of getting people to provide a more current piece of metadata themselves is in many ways higher than the difficulty of running something like a trans certificate transparency log to store the, like it would, would really be the snapshot or the hash of the snapshot, so really the timestamp metadata would be. And then once you have that, then it's easy to go and re, reconstruct what you need um, using like the, effectively the Merkle tree signature stored inside of a transparency log. Yeah, um, I, mean, I, I was kind of thinking of it essentially as, um, a service to retrieve the information that you don't have. <laughs> um, yes, basically, yeah. And so, if if we want to design something that we don't have it, then having a service that gives you the information you need does start to make sense. Yeah, I, I completely agree with this. Um, I I think this would be a good a good way to do it now. Of course, you want the service to be trusted and da 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 da. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I think um, I think this would be a very natural way to kind of merge the things together. Okay, we can do an analysis of this and we can rewrite um, document to include that. We may just remove design option one altogether and try to make it coherent. It seems like that might be easier. Um, does anyone else, like, I guess, I guess one of my questions about this is, does that then mean that every registry everywhere uses the same Thing to store its snapshot uh, hashes, like its timestamp metadata. Um, do we run this as like a public service that anybody 
uses or what do we how do we do this i don't know actually i mean i think that i mean i have a kind of other question about what the i mean i think that you've been working under the assumption that the registry is the right organizational unit size i'm not sure that i'm convinced that that is the right size and there are i guess there are two there are two options there's bigger than that i it's global or there's smaller than that i um there are more routes than registries and um and people are there's there's a number of people that's independent from the registries who are maintaining routes and i'm i think that those are still all potentially design options for the whole thing so, so design but, but I think, options. oh sorry no i mean i think say, yeah go on go on um the, the place where we kind of landed on that is that um instead so in tough currently the the targets the root of your targets metadata is uh comes from the root file so the targets metadata that you care about comes from there but what we've sort of proposed in this is that the targets file um like root is effectively your credentials that you put in like it comes in your system ahead of time so you control that directly so the root um, file can be uniform and can be uniform across the entire registry because all it controls is snapshot and timestamp. So it's no longer actually a very security sensitive role in the system. It's gone from being super important because it controlled targets to being, you know, the thing that lets you deal with compromise of snapshot or timestamp. I don't know if that made any sense or if I just said something more confusing than I meant to. Um, but but it, in that regard, then the idea would be that for all of, let's say, like a large registry, you would you could happily use the same root file because only it, it's only snapshot and whatever else, and everybody has their own individual um, top level targets file. This is tap 13, by the way, if, if you're looking to figure out where to go for this. Okay, I it would be helpful to kind of call that out in the dark a bit more clearly maybe, because. Okay, we'll make this all more clear. Yeah. Um, we, it, it's enough of it is out of date that we probably need to like almost start fresh, not quite start fresh, but at least Re look at everything and strongly revise it all. Yeah, I agree. Especially trying out design option one, which at this point is more confusing than illuminating. And, well, we've, uh, we've, adding, we've, yeah, we've, we've thrown out two options now, so which is, I think, good progress. Um, so, so actually, like, I think it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely clearer if there's if, it is, if there's one option that we're kind of iterating on at a time and then find it rather than, because it's actually, if there's, then you can just explain that one option rather than having to say, say there's two alternatives. So I think, uh, yeah, I do, yeah, I do think we need to talk or think a little more about what to do in the private repo case with, um, if our option, if we're really moving to this only certificate uh, transparency log style thing, whether they have to set up a private instance just to do that, which doesn't make sense. I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't make sense. They, that would be a very logical thing for them to do in that case, but we would just have to mention that as this is the way to do it. Yeah, we should really be careful about some of these. I mean, we're seeing more and more and more these air gapped environments becoming the norm. And for anybody that's been following the MCR thread, we've had to change the data endpoints. Like there is, customers do not like their clients having access to things that they don't own. So we need to not make it only for the big 
companies to implement because it's really tough, uh, difficult. You know, it needs to be something the average company can do very easily to be able to have their environment be completely trusted and isolated. Because it's not, I, I wrote it in one of these things, this is not just, you know, submarines in these large esoteric scenarios. These are the average company wants everything locked down from anything public as a standard security measure. And they only move content into that environment in a trusted way. And then the way they move content into it, that's the part that gets more secure. Um, but it's the fact that they have a, an isolated environment is the standard. Yeah, I think having them set up a container or whatever that runs the, their repository or their registry, having them set up one that runs like the certificate transparency log sort of thing feels like it it might be the right, um, might, might be usable enough. I don't know if what others think about that, but. We're almost at time for thinking time. I mean, I think we would, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, we'd have to think about that. But I mean, I th yeah, I mean, if that's, if that's what you need to run for it to be secure, then, um, I would say with all I'm, these curious, I'm curious about whether we, you, I mean, how much we could, I guess the question is what secure, uh, what properties are different from the register, whether we could bundle it into the registry, whether we could include the transparency log as part of the registry, whether, or whether it, um, or how that's going to work. I just I have to think about if it. If you stick it in there, it's it's, if you stick it in there, it's basically just the snapshot and timestamp with with keeping history. It's yeah. basically what Tuff does. Yeah. Um, but separating it out gives you this, like if somebody breaks into it, then maybe they don't have access to to both kind of things. So yeah, I mean the the log model is yeah, I mean the the yeah. So and you need other people potentially to replicate it for you. I mean, the public transparency log model has actually been working reasonably well in, this, in the sense that people have, like, people have lost their keys and things, and it's, uh, but not everyone has simultaneously. Um, yeah. Um, okay, well, we'll think some more. It and we'll mention our thoughts in the notary v2 uh slack channel but we, we'll try to revise i'll i'll try to go through with marina and anybody else who's interested and in, go through and try to revise this um our, our things so that they make design option to be the design option and we'll talk about um using this sort of transparency log way of this looking at this metadata as as though it is the the one true way um because I, I totally agree like with something Justin Cormack said, which is that, you know, looking at one option and walking down that path is easier, is the right way to go rather than trying to pull in different directions and talk about all that. So we'll fix our mistakes in that area. Yeah, and keeping track of why we switch the other one so we don't loop back around and repeat it. Um, so having one is good, but maybe capturing why we decided to go that one uh, versus the other to help us stay on that rail until we find the next issue. Cool. All right, we're at time. Um, so it looks like we've got uh, Signy next week. And uh, I know Niaz has been trying to get some key management stuff going on. So we encourage to help him get the quorum on a time slot. Thanks, folks. Thanks, thanks. Thank you, bye.